Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody, to be here with us and welcome, everybody. I I, I tell you the story uh, how I meet uh, Jim and Tognane virtually because we never met personally. They are quite far from here. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I was starting a, a, a work in a multinational company in the branch, the Italian branch. And uh, because I was looking for something different from the uh, usual, you know, agile methodology, I I was really curious to 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 get another approach. So I get in touch with uh, Obey Association by accident, but was a, an incredible good accident. And uh, Bart and Dolph uh, told me with a suggestion to get in touch with Jim and Tonyan and follow the the program, the Lean Agile Visual Management, because um, most of the, what I do now with the Obeya is uh, uh, related to visual management. So. Um, and that's why we got, got in touch. I, I, I uh, follow different lean coffee together. Uh, I don't remember if there were Jim or Tonyan together, but I remember that we did some when possible because nine hours different if you do in the afternoon here is quite late by night. So <laughs> it was quite impossible. Okay, we will come in Italy, we will have a, a work together with a symposium about Obeya, but after that uh, we will want, would like to, to, to do this uh, today's program, the 24th and 25th of uh, July, uh, June and not July, June. And um, so uh, we are here to explain what uh, does personal Kanban mean and how did it comes about? Right. Is that a prompt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a prompt, it's up, it's up to you. <laughs> no. If that's a prompt, I, I'll run. I'll run with it. Uh, so the first thing that, that I'll just quickly say is uh, so I'm I'm Jim Benson, uh, and in um, uh, my background uh, is in uh, initially in angry punk rock music, and then in urban planning and design uh, and civil engineering. So I went from yelling and jumping up and down with a guitar to um, building freeways and subways and uh, cities. And while I was doing that, uh, I was always the guy who knew something about computers. Uh, so I became uh, part of, at the very beginning, something that was originally called uh, uh, well, it was called IVHS, which is uh, Intelligent Vehicle Highway Systems, and then became ITS, which is Intelligent, Intelligent Transportation Systems, but it was applying uh, growing com computer technology to transportation. Uh, we built the first uh, real-time traffic website for the Washington Department of Transportation here in Seattle. Uh, then I built the second one, uh, which was more like if you use Google Maps, that's kind of my grandchild. <laughs> so we built the first GIS based uh, traffic system. When while that was going on, we switched from being urban planners, my, my, my old business partner, William and I, to having a software company that made software for government for transportation, obviously. And when we started writing those that software, we were looking for things that we could do to write it well. And a friend of ours in, introduced us to this guy named Kent Beck, who was in the process of writing a book called XP Explained. Uh, and so that's how we became Agile, is we were working with Kent before the XP stuff came out, um, somewhat directly. And... Um, uh, it was funny, like years before we actually met him, <laughs> finally met him at a at a Kanban conference of all things in Germany <laughs> uh, many years later. But um, but while we were doing XP and then later a little bit of Scrum, we realized for a variety of reasons that two week iterations didn't work. And so we started this thing where we were showing what we hadn't done yet and what we were working on and what was complete. There's a long story around that that I won't bother telling you. But because of that, uh, we ended up inventing, you know, Kanban and personal Kanban. So if you're familiar with uh, the 
pro Kanban stuff or the lean Kanban university stuff or the flight level stuff, all of that is outgrowths from what I was originally doing at Gray Hill Solutions and Dave Anderson was doing at Microsoft. And so he and I would meet weekly and have conversations about what we were doing. And we kind of grew this splinter group, which then has caused all sorts of unnecessary conversations about arguments. But in the end, we're all just here to manage our work. Uh, so that's that's me. Um, and just as a quick introduction, Tony, do you want to add uh, you? Sure. Because you it are... <laughs> yeah, also because you are co-author and, and, yes. and co-trader with uh, Jim. Well, first, I wanted to thank Alaria and Fabio so much for, for having us and for all of you joining. Um, as I as some of you may have seen um, in my LinkedIn post, I could not be more excited to be bringing personal Kanban to Italy. Um, and we have um, some exciting news at the end of this year, I would imagine. Um, Roby, um, Roberto Pugliesi, who's on this call, is actually our translator for the Italian version of personal Kanban, which will be coming out later this year. And I'm very, very... Yeah, Thank you so much for being here, <laughs> Um, So I'm Tony. Um, I'm originally from New York City. I started out in the fashion industry. And um, I a lot of people are like, well, you know, how how did you start out in the fashion industry and wind up here? And it's it's kind of a kind of an interesting story. I worked in the fashion industry for about six years, and then I had an opportunity to go to Europe and live for a year in Germany. And I'm sure most of you know you all don't tell the Germans are the capital of fashion, not Germany. So there wasn't much opportunity for me in fashion in Germany. I came back to the United States. I wound up in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that my travels in Europe really caused me to fall in love with was history. So I went back to school for history. I went to university and, and I got my graduate degree also in history, focused a lot on the Italian Renaissance. And um, one of the things that I really appreciated about history was um, all the different systems that were are, that were at work with history. So, you know, you have your, your political systems, your social systems, your economic systems, but more important, you have your human systems. And so what motivates people to act in which the systems in which they find themselves. So if you just put a pin in that, I really appreciated that aspect of history. While I was working um, as public historian in Washington, D.C., I received a message from a friend who said they knew somebody who was writing a book on social media. And that, that person was Jim. And he needed somebody for a book. He needed an historian. And so Jim and I would come together online and we would talk. We would talk about, you know, the book that we were going to write and whatnot. And um, at some point, he had the opportunity to come to Seattle, to come to Washington, D.C. to do some work and ask me if I would work with him there. So he closed up his office in Washington, in Washington State, came to Washington, D.C. The job that we were supposed to do fell apart. All right. We wound up not getting paid something like eighty thousand dollars after we didn't get paid. We wound up we found ourselves sitting on the floor in Jim's apartment and we were talking about the system that he put together when he was in Washington for how he closed his office. And the system looked something like this. It was a whiteboard or it was a flip chart and it had all these columns on it and all the work that he had to do, he had on sticky notes in one column and all the work that was complete would, would wind up in the final column. And when he was working through the work, he would pull it through this value stream and he would be able to see all that he was done. So we started to play around with that system a little bit. And we started writing some blog posts and then people were like, where's the book? And we said, well, it's just sticky notes on a whiteboard, right? It doesn't need a book. And um, in the process, Jim went back to Seattle where there was actually paying work. And, um, but people kept saying to us, where's the book, where's the book? And the first people who called us about the book was the United Nations, about, about working with us was not software development. It was moms and kids and schools and the World Bank. And we're like, the World this, Bank. Isn't just, this isn't just sticky notes on a whiteboard. So we scrapped the first book that we were doing and we decided to write Personal Kanban. And the reason that I'm telling you about this is this is really this is probably the origins of where what we're going to talk to you today come from. So in the morning, we would turn on Skype. We would get into a shared Google Doc. 
And we would have a rudimentary board where we had all the work for the book and the left column. We had the work that we were doing in the center and the work we were complete on the right. And we would get into the shared doc and we would write for hours. And we didn't know each other very well. So we would we were learning about each other. We were learning how each other works. But there was this one day where Jim looked at me and said, sweetheart, don't you have to make dinner? And I said, what do you mean do I have to make dinner? We just started working. I just had breakfast. We had been working for something like 12 hours. I didn't even realize the time had gone by. Because we had everything that we needed at a glance, we knew who was working on what, we knew how much work we had to accomplish that day. We knew what work was stuck and needed, needed, you know, needed collaboration. It gave us both such a sense of clarity over the work that we were doing, a sense of calm, knowing that we were completing work in, in a, a steady fashion. And at the end of the day, we were able to see all that we had accomplished, which made us feel great. And up until this day, it was the best working experience of my life. And I attribute it to the system that we had built. I talked about systems before that I came at this from a love of systems. And we recognize it was that there's so many elements of personal Kanban that work because they satisfy human needs. And we can, I don't, I don't want to take that, um, Fabio, I'll let you ask the questions. I don't want to go too deep into the psychology mm -hmm. of work, which I do very, I, I go deep into understanding why this works in our live class. And I could talk about it if there's any interest during this call, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll end there. In fact, I remember that um, in some of uh, your articles and videos, also, um, you often mention the concept of systems. Uh, and yes. so the question is, wh why do you think it is crucial uh, to understand uh, that we work within system and what does it mean? You know, I think it I think it helps us recognize um, interconnectedness and a complexity about the world around us and how our actions have far reaching unintended consequences. So it, it also gives us like a holistic view of our work, right? So mm -hmm. systems thinking encourages us to look at problems and situations from this holistic perspective. So, you know, you're considering all these various components um, rather than just focusing on isolated parts. And that's very much what personal Kanban does because you're visualizing a person's entire workflow. And so you're mm -hmm. getting this holistic view of their system. And that visibility helps you look, look, helps you surface bottlenecks. It helps you surface dependencies. As I said before, it helps you surface areas where there's opportunities for collaboration, where there's opportunities for improvement across that, in, uh, that entire, en entire value stream. And, you know, and that's the first. So I should start with personal Kanban only has two roles. And the first one is to visualize your work. And that's what I'm saying. So you could see that interconnectedness. You have this holistic view of your work. And the second rule is to limit your work in progress. And by limit your work in progress, that is helping you promote continuous flow. But it's also helping you avoid unintended consequences. So what is an unintended consequence? Un unintended consequence is not knowing how much work you're taking on and not recognizing you have a capacity. That is one of the biggest problems we see that individuals, not even just teams, I mean, as team is just individuals, you know, times, times whatever number, but we tend to take on way more work than we realize. So when we start visualizing our work, one thing per sticky note, we can see where that becomes problematic. So I'm gonna just tell one really quick story. I think it's appropriate here. Um, work and life have definitely blurred especially since COVID. Um, but truthfully, before the lockdown, I was using a lot of agile tools, a lot of visualizations in my own life. So I don't really view this as a work tool. It can be used throughout, it's life is life. And so we were working with the client and on a Wednesday afternoon, halfway through, this woman had been talking about how her son had been such a slacker. Fabio, is there a word in Italian for slacker? Somebody who doesn't want to work? What is the word? <laughs> Oh, let, let me see, because I don't know how to translate. Because there probably aren't slackers in it, in, in, in Italy. Everybody just knows how to live well, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Wait, was it? 
Fagnolone. Okay. Fagnolone. Fagnolone. Lazzarone. Is that? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Fagnolone. Fagnolone. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's not easy. Using that. Okay. Um. So she was. She. She was convinced her son was a slacker because he didn't want to do any of his work. And I said, well, let's put his work on a Kanban. So what we did, we had a regular ready doing and done Kanban. But I asked her to please put on one sticky note, per one everything that he had to do. So he had to Matematica, he had to do Geografia, he had to do Historia, all, all of his subjects. He had to do violin, he had to do um, chess club. I made her do all of these and I made her say, how many times per week does he have to do them? When she was done putting this list together, I think this child was maybe nine. The list was this long. She looked at me, she looked at the list, hands in my heart, she started crying. She said, I had no idea I was doing this to my child. Because she wasn't visualizing the work, his capacity, she had no idea how overloaded he was. And so that was one of my favorite examples of how you can use personal Kanban to surface your capacity and to prevent unintended consequences, which would have been that child not having a childhood. There was no time for him to play and be a little boy on that board. Yeah. Beautiful. So the key message is visualize your work in order to understand what's happening and what you have to really do. Uh, so I remember one of your um, video, and I know from Tonyan there is also an, an article, we would like to translate it, uh, that you say that Kanban alone is never enough. Yeah. Well, so so part, of, part of the reason for that, and also part of the reason why Tony's story worked, was before that woman had visualized her kid's work, there, she didn't have a good idea of what the narrative was of that work. She didn't know how much there was, what, uh, what the stress level might be from it, how hard it was to do, where there were points of victory, where the you know the kid had done something wonderful or cool. Um, and so, because of that, she had a missing. She didn't understand the nature of his work, and for all of us at the office or even at the virtual office right now, if we're not visualizing our work, then we we don't see that story, right? So uh, right now, if I just do this, all of a sudden, this is much a much less compelling conversation than it is when you get to see my beautiful face. Uh, so, uh, when we see things, we connect with them, we understand them, and then we can manage them, but manage sounds like, you know, manipulate or work. But in this case, C is like, relate to, take ownership of, uh, get satisfaction from. And so that's why personal Kanban works. And then to extend that from what Fabio just said, why isn't personal Kanban not enough? It's because alongside that personal Kanban board, if she set one up for her kid, would also be pictures of like the kid winning a chess match or or the or a or a paper that the kid wrote that was like super awesome or something else that indicated that there was progress uh that could be identified with by the product of the work so if we're solving problems those should be visualized if we've had some sort of victory that should be visualized if other things change over time those things should be visualized and so the Kanban ends up being the bedrock or the cornerstone of what we call an obeya. And an obeya is a room or a place where you keep all of these different visualizations. And the reason for that is just because life and because your story is more complicated and more interesting than can just be on a Kanban. Okay, so to, to build up uh, the, the way to uh, recognize, to make visual your works is something that it has also to, uh, to do about stress at work. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I Are you, let me uh so okay. so Tony, if you want to start with that, then I'll show a picture from Turner and then just go nuts. So one of the things that Jim and I um pay attention to, I mentioned the psychology of work. And there's one model that I really enjoy, and it's called SCARF. I'll put it over here. S C A R F. S C A R F from Dr. David Rock. And so when building systems, especially work systems, work systems that I want to be humane, I make sure that they take into consideration the elements of SCARF. So what is SCARF? So they have discovered, neuroscience has discovered that there is a crossover in the brain mm -hmm. between physical pain and social pain. So if I were to ask any of you, tell me about a time where you broke a leg or you broke your arm, you'd probably just tell me as a matter of course. If I were to ask you, tell me about a time where you lost someone you loved. Well, I would argue you're probably going to see it on, I'm probably going to see it on your face. There's probably going to be a visceral reaction. And I would also argue having lost a love is probably going to hurt more in the long term than the memory of a lost leg of a broken leg or a broken arm. So why is that? So we have this crossover, we know, and that's a social pain. So loss is a social pain. So SCARF stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. We know that all of these, similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, SCARF are needs for, for humans in a system to work well. So status, they need to know that they have a sense. When we walk into any room, the first thing that we do, we are, we are surveying our environment for threats, right? And so one of the ways that we do this is, you know, who is taller than us, who is shorter than us, who is, has more power than us, who has more money than us. We're always kind of negotiating this. So in the office, if your boss comes to you and says, do you have five minutes? Can you come and talk to me for five minutes? That probably will put you in more of a threat state than if one of your colleagues says, can I have five minutes of your time? So building systems where we recognize that status can cause people to behave differently and interact differently is important. The next one is certainty. And this is really important with personal Kanban. When we have a lack of certainty or clarity, it puts us in a state of fear because when we don't have clarity or certainty about what's going to happen, that's a risk, right? Because we don't know how to manage what's about to happen. So giving our people as much clarity and certainty as they can what does that look like with a board? How much work they have to do at any given time? Well, we know we're never going to overload them if we don't have to. They will always know how much work is coming down the pike. They will always know what they are responsible for. They'll know what the team is working on. So whether it's the Obeya, whether it is personal Kanban, any visualization at work will give people that sense of clarity, that sense of certainty. The A in SCARF is autonomy. We want to make sure that people have the agency and the control over their own work. And that's something that we likewise do with personal Kanban. When you're pull, we don't impose work. It's a pull system. People pull the work um, as much as they, they have the capacity for. Relatedness is the R. We understand. We talk about a holistic view of our work. Kanban gives us a holistic view of our work. So does the Obeya. And fairness. We all have the same amount of, of whip limit. So what we want to do is we want to create that system that is healthy and humane and takes into consideration the psychological needs of, and Jim will show this to you right now. Yeah. So I, okay, my, I'm good. Okay. okay. So make, sure, make sure I wasn't muted again. Uh, so, so yes, what does this actually mean to human beings? So these three guys here are human beings. <laughs> uh, all three of them. I've met them. I know they are. This is, this is Charlie. Um, this is, uh, um, <laughs> Kevin <laughs> and this is Sal. Um, Kevin is the guy we're going to tell a story about. So Kevin at this point is still pretty young. It's about 10 years ago. Um, and he is a procurement agent for Turner construction in New York city. And, uh, a procurement agent buys everything for a construction project. So we were working on billion dollar plus construction projects in New York City, and Kevin was responsible for buying everything for those projects. So everything from the structural steel to the concrete, to the toilet paper rolls, to the mirrors in the bathrooms, everything. 
he was responsible for making all of those purchases. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of um, opportunity for him to fail. And just before I go on from this, you'll note that Charlie Whitney in his office here has his personal Kanban right there on the wall uh, and still does to this day. Uh, so then we built this Obeya, this room, this, ma this management room for one of Kevin's projects. Uh, these are the two buildings that are going to be built here. They were um, the business school for Columbia University. Um, this is a Kanban. Uh, you all might recognize this. Uh, your Kanban will probably start off with something like uh, options, doing and done. But Kevin had a lot more work to do. So it takes everything from originally starting any bid, which is any package of purchase that's going to be made for the project. And then it goes through all of these different stages and right off the end of this screen. So there was like 27 full stages. So here is Scarf and Kevin and Kanban and the whole why of why we have these things. Um, there was one evening... So Turner Construction is a multinational corporation. They're very large. They have a lot of offices. And so they have a lot of HR people, human resources people. So they all met, every single one of them, in New York for a little conference. And as part of that conference, they came to the office to see Kevin's room. So Kevin, young guy, not quite you know, sure of himself yet is giving this presentation saying, you know, this is our Kanban. Uh, these are some problems that we're solving. This is our, uh, these are some of our goals that we're on our way to meeting and how far we along we are. And then there were other things around the corner. Um, down here, you can even see the Obeya stuff that we're putting into the room. Uh, and um, he goes through and he says this, he says, before I had this board and we were visualizing our work like, oh, I can't do it because I'm sharing my screen now, but but we're, visual, we're visualizing our work by not seeing it. Before he could see his work, he had a spreadsheet and he would take that spreadsheet. And again, this guy over here is Charlie Whitney. He was one of his bosses. He would take the spreadsheet to Charlie Whitney and he would say, this is what I'm doing today. Then he would go to Frank and he would tell Frank what he was doing that day. And then he would go to the other Charlie, Charlie Murphy, and he would tell Charlie Murphy what he was doing that day. And all of them would give him guidance. And when people look at the thing that you're doing, the spreadsheet that you're working on, and you're making decisions and they give you guidance, it feels like criticism. So he would start every day by walking around the building and having people critique what he did the day before. And that's not fun. That's not, that's hostile. So when we set up this room, there are, there's green things that can be put on here. There's orange things, there's red things. And each of these have different meanings. So I need Charlie Murphy's help with this. I need Charlie Whitney's help with this. I need Frank's help with this. And so they asked Kevin directly, they said, does this help your work-life balance? And Kevin said, I work in construction. I work all day and all night. That's just the way construction is. You know, I, it's not going to go away. He said, but with this, every time I make a decision, Charlie, Charlie, and uh, Frank, I'll see it immediately. Mm. And he said, and then I know that they have my back. They know that they know decisions as I'm making them. So if they want to do something different, they can tell me. But there's no need to critique something that actually isn't wrong. So someone shows you something and says, do you have a comment? You'll come up with comments. But what they found was when this was up, they had a lot fewer comments because they understood the context in which Kevin was making the decisions. So Kevin looks at them and says, this doesn't help my work-life balance. He said, but it does impact my quality of life. Everybody knows what I'm doing. Uh, I can make decisions with confidence. And then what we realized then was, first of all, just when he said, I can, I can, he said, well, he actually said, was, I can act with confidence. What we realized then was that without visualizations, nobody actually ever acts with confidence. And that's scary. That means that every day, all day, in almost every business in the world, people are making unconfident decisions 
And then they have to live with the results of that, which attacks every one of those scarf letters that Tony Ann talked about. So here is this board here. And I just want to show this really quick and then I will shut up. Here is this board, weirdly enough, at, at Columbia Business School. It looks entirely different. It goes from the top of the wall to the bottom of the wall. Uh, the active uh, bid packages, because there were so many, they didn't want them as tickets. They wanted to understand what was being done. Workflows from top to bottom. The sticky notes are where something is in progress. Whether it's in peril is red, okay is green, kind of weird is yellow. And if you zoom in, you can see that they're getting operational information when things were expected, when they actually happened and reasons for gaps at every single one of what was previously these states. So instead of flowing from left to right, this is flowing from top to bottom. It's a totally weird Kanban, but it works for them, right? It works for them in this group. And this is their Obeya. So up here, they have their calendar. Over here, they have a problem that they're solving. And this is an Obeya for a different project where you can see that there's a more standard Kanban over here. There's a heat map. There's pictures of things going on the site. But that's that's the long and the short of it right there. Sorry about that. That was, that was really long for both me and Tony combined. But uh, <laughs> that, that, if anything... If, if you take that and you kind of stretch it out, like how to build the visual controls, how to build the Kanban, how to see the work, what it means psychologically, that is what the class is going to be about in Milan. And I'm, I am so excited for it because we haven't taught one of these together live in a long time. And Tony and I have picked up so many new tricks that this is going to be unlike any class that we've ever done before. And we've done these on every continent with all kinds of people everywhere. So that's my plug. <laughs> well, you know, and it, it has to be different than what we used to teach because the world has changed so much, mm. you know? I mean, four years ago, getting dressed up to sit in front of my computer just made no sense at all, right? <laughs> I mean, I would be actually coming to you all and speaking to you. So having work actually come into my home now, I need a system to manage that. Mm -hmm. I don't just need a system to manage my work. I need a system to manage how do I integrate work in a healthy manner into my home? Because now I'm actually working at four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, because I have European clients. I'm working late at night. I'm visiting with my friends on Zoom now on weekends. It's crazy. Um, and so ensuring, you know, Jim, Jim said, while Kevin didn't get a work-life balance, he did have a healthier integration. You know, I mean, it was just the nature of his business that he was always going to be getting be getting phone calls. But I find creating systems to help me work intentionally and to help me live intentionally has helped me with my stress level so much. And, you know, one of the tickets that I constantly have on my board since lockdown is, is a 25 minute ticket that says garden, go into my garden, go walk on grass go water my tomatoes, get away from my desk, because I need that reminder. It's so easy when you're just working to just go on autopilot, but having a ticket on my board reminds me to live more intentionally and not just to focus on, on tasks, on processing tasks. And that's a problem. So many of us just want to be uh, productive. So in English, we have three words that a lot of people use interchangeably and Jim and I don't feel that they're actually interchangeable. People use the word productivity, effectiveness and efficiency. And productivity is just doing more and more and more and more and more. But if we're not doing the things that bring us value, the things that bring us joy, the things that, that we love, then what's the purpose of living? So that is what I have been working on with my own personal Kanban in my own personal Obeya, which I'm hoping to share for those of you who do come to our class. I'm hoping to show you how I am utilizing all of these to have a better life. 
to learn Italian. It's helping me learn Italian. It's helping me, you know, learn chess. I mentioned chess before. It helped me get through a, a wine certification. I'm, I'm studying wine. And I could never do this without a system in place to show me my success, where I'm being held up. The other thing that I wanted to say really quick, we do talk a lot about the psychology behind what we behind the work that we're doing. A study came out a couple of years ago that showed so much as saying, and in English it's it's called the F word, so much as saying I am finished actually makes you feel good. It gives you a burst of the neurochemical serotonin, which makes you feel good. But it also gives you a burst of dopamine, which is habit forming. So every time you pull a ticket into done, that sense of completion literally feels good. But there's more to that. It wants you to optimize for that burst of serotonin and dopamine again. So it compels you not just to finish something, but to start and do something else. So it helps motivate you to do more and you have a healthier work, work habit, work, work ritual. So if I were to ask all of you who are used to using a to-do list, you know, when you write your tasks down and you cross them off as you're doing them, how many of us have done something that is not on our to-do list, but we write it down after we're done just so we have the satisfaction of crossing it out? Because that feels good. That sense of completion feels good. And that is what the Kanban is giving us. Mm, I have a, a difficult question now for you, both of you. Uh -oh. <laughs> is that one? In my experience, Obeya is a, an extraordinary approach in order to, you know, obtain from people collaboration, make everything visual, uh, everything is clear. They can just make agreement very fast indeed. But what about when you have a toxic environment? How do you manage it? It's, it's difficult. I know. I know. Jim, we oh no, so sorry. sorry. Yeah. I was. I was, was, I was muted. I was muted. Um, we have we have toxic stories. Trust us. We, we, we share yeah, lots, lots of, of unfortunate stories, stories about toxic environments. <laughs> we w one of the things that we've said the most in working with clients is, "Did you really think that was a good idea?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the first story uh, that I would talk about is was actually also from Turner. Uh, and, uh, there was a, a guy there, uh, named, uh, named Doug, who at that time was the director of lean for the Eastern region. And we were having a lean coffee with a bunch of other people at Turner and lean and I, and agile ideas hadn't fully made their way into the company yet. And one day one woman asks Doug, what is the best lean project right now that you could um, recommend that I go take a look at? And she says, he said, uh, it's the Greenpoint project. And she's like, isn't this guy, uh, isn't man whose name I'm not saying, <laughs> uh, isn't he the project executive of, um, of, of that project? And he says, yeah. And she's like, he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's he's like he's like super mean to people i mean what how is that even possible and she's he's like no you should go take a look at the project so i had known this guy for a while and i and he was just a a lovely guy you know so I, the next time i'm meeting with him i said hey uh, i learned something the other day and he said what's that and i said i learned that you're an asshole and he's like yeah i, I really am i am i am terrible and I was like, I, I don't understand how that works. And he says, well, in construction, the way that things get done or historically the things that the way things have gotten done is that something goes wrong. You figure out who you can blame. You bring them into your office and you yell and scream and curse and jump up and down until they feel really bad about themselves. And then you yell at them some more just to prove to them that you have the power to yell at them. And then you kick them out of your office. And he said, I was really good at that. He's like, I've been, I've been in the in the industry for 35 years. I was really good at that. That's how I got to where I am today. And then he said, he said, but when we moved into this office and we started to do lean and we decided we wanted to respect people, we came up with a rule. And the rule was no yelling in the construction trailer, no yelling in the office. 
And that was all it took to change this guy's behavior. That was it. That was all it took. So years and years of institutionalized toxicity. And what he said was, I was really good at that, but who wants to live like this? So lots of times those people who are doing really crazy toxic things are doing so because they're in a system that requires that interaction, that behavior. And so there is a lot of toxicity that's really hard to get rid of. It's hard to get rid of when someone is a narcissist. When someone really is a jerk, it is hard to stop that. But lots of people behave like jerks who aren't. And they include all of us. You know, so we're in a situation where we're stressed out. We're trying to get from one place to another. Uh, like maybe we're trying to get through the airport and there's something holding up the line or something like that. And we become more and more stressed because we can't move. And then by the time we get up to the front of the line, let's just say that we're not even mean. We're just really abrupt and impatient to get through the, through, through the transaction with the person at the desk. We will become toxic, even if it's just a little tiny level of toxic. They'll feel our stress, our fear, and that that translates over to them. So it can be like that guy. It can be super pronounced, but often it's just it's just attitude and stress that create that toxicity. So we find that when we visualize the narrative, we visualize the work as a whole, and people can see what the logical next step is or steps or options that they have, then they can do what Kevin said, which is act with confidence. And then when they do that, it satisfies Tony's scarf goals. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, a lot of that toxicity dissipates because we have removed the primary causes for people's stress. And um, we have done this over and over again, uh, partially by visualizing work and then partially also by getting those agreements. No yelling in the trailer. We solve problems together. Uh, they're all, all these offices that we work in end up coming with, up with their own, their own reasons for doing these things. But when they do, that gives politeness. Uh, it gives people permission to both calm down and help other people's calm down. Do you want to jump on that, Tony? Again, I have a personal story as far as toxicity goes. Um, I, I feel I'm speaking to people who will understand this. Um, Christmas, Christmas time, a lot of stress, especially in the States, because I believe it's an Italian American custom, the Feast of Seven Fishes. Am I correct? That it's not, it's not celebrated in Italy. Is that correct, Fabio? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, in, in the U S there's an Italian American custom that says Italian American women have to kill themselves at the holidays, cooking seven fish courses on Christmas Eve. And so this past year, I love doing this. This past year, I was going to co-host this with my cousins. And I swore I wasn't going to stress anybody out. But there's something like after seven just shellfish dishes, there's something like 15 dishes or something like that. How do we co coordinate? And so what I introduced them to, may I share my screen real quick, Fabio? Yep. Okay. So this was how I managed my Christmas Eve. And I have a uh, I have an article that I wrote about this that I can put in the link um, in the chat, but I put a Kanban up for all the different dishes, what stage of preparation they were in, what, what they're, um, I'm able to open the cards and everybody's able to see the recipe. People are able to see what was prepared. What do I do on the 23rd? What do I do on Christmas Eve? Everything that's done on Christmas day and all of these things were done. And my office is right off of the kitchen and I kept this board up. 
And my cousins would run in here and every time they were like, okay, you know, we have the stuffed mushrooms. We're gonna, we're gonna pull those into done. Those were done. And you know what? The cannolis, they're, the canola, they're gonna have to wait. So we're gonna have to push those back or let's get these out on the table. And people were able to see just because of the images, people also able to see if something was stuck in in a in uh, in preparation where they could help somebody else and it was the least stressful holiday i have ever had again this is a tool called kanban zone you can do this with a with a tool you can do i used to do this with just sticky notes in my kitchen when the when the meal wasn't as intricate but because the meal was so intricate and i had people collaborating with me from their homes ahead of time, we had to utilize an on, on an online board. And so it it really was the the most enjoyable. I'm not gonna say easiest, I'm gonna say the most enjoyable holiday. Did we get everything done that we wanted to? No, you never get everything done that you want to. But we got most everything done that I wanted to. And I learned a very valuable lesson. Done is not always the final state. Done is not always your goal. My goal with this Christmas was not pulling tickets into done. My goal this Christmas was not stressing out my relatives, was giving everybody a wonderful time and making people want to come to my house again for the next holiday. That was my end state. And the people that I was collaborating understood that. And this gave us that system where we knew everything that had to happen, it, we didn't stress out. We didn't feel like anything was going to be forgotten. And it gave us clarity and, and no stress. So, yeah. Great. Okay, I will stop sharing. Oh, I can't stop sharing. Somebody's going to have to take I, this. I did, I did for you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it's okay. So we, we are going uh, to meet you the 24th and 25th of June. What we will do, tell us something more about uh, this uh, couple of days of program that uh, we are going to organize. Okay, so in the end, what we want everyone to be able to do is create, create easy visualizations <laughs> uh, that allow everyone involved in a project to quickly communicate what they need to know. And that can just be you alone uh, or any number of people more than you. Um, so it's the simplest projects like, uh, like for me recording some music or something all the way up to building a multi-billion dollar um, uh, construction project um, or software or what have you. Uh, we want people to, um, or people will, uh, learn how to build certainly a Kanban and a, and a personal Kanban, and that's easy. Uh, we will learn about how to build visual systems at all. So visual systems have components in them that we don't have time to get into right now, but they're really interesting and you will love them. <laughs> and so we are going to cover those seven elements of any visual control which you will not get in any other Kanban or Agile class. Uh, that's very unique to us. Um, we likewise then, go deep into the psychology of work. Yep. So you'll understand why this works. Yep. And we'll be balancing the whole time between the personal, the team, the company. Uh, what information do people need at any given time to be able to act with confidence? And uh, this will be, it's very practical, but it's also very personal. And uh, we're very proud of that uh, because lots of places like just teach you a tool or lots of classes just teach you a tool or they just teach you some theory and then you don't know how to, how to apply the theory. Well, this is kind of the best of both worlds. We'll have, you know, the, the philosophy behind the tool that allows you to actually implement these things and use them reliably and not use them for a little while and then stop. Um, so what we'll actually do is initially we'll start by going through what personal Kanban is and how it works. And then using that as our initial tool or our initial system, then we'll explore the whys of how it works and then the hows of how to build other visualizations like that. 
Great, thank you, Jim. Toyan, would you like to add something? I'm just really excited that we're gonna be with hopefully many of you in three weeks. And uh, okay, because, because I saw that normally people intend the Kanban or Scrum board as you know, the traditional uh, to do working process done. But um, as we saw in your example, it's much more complex sometimes a, a, a board, this kind of board is uh, depend on uh, what you need. Yeah, no, no. So this is so you you can never just open the Scrum book and do Scrum. You can never open one of Ken's Kent Beck's books and just do XP. You can't open the Kanban book or the personal Kanban book and just do it because your work is unique to you. There are different things that you need to know and you need to track. And if you don't track those things, then you're just using somebody else's idea poorly. And number one, that's boring. <laughs> Other people's ideas are boring, but you are not. Uh, and then number two is it means that if you are working with anybody else, they won't understand why they're using it because it doesn't speak to them. Yeah. So when you make with the team, you have just to take an agreement, everybody, on what you need to represent on the wall. And and then you need to figure out in real time when the ball is wrong mm. or when it's not giving you the right information and you need to change those visualizations. So I there are companies out there that we worked with right now that I know if we went back to them, they would still be using the same board that we left them with and we would be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that uh, Obeya normally uh, change with the time. It's really yep. an evolution within an Obeya. It's incredible. It's true. So, you know, a, a couple of years ago, there was a couple of months where I would show up at work and I'd sign into our online Kanban and it'd be gone. And I would look at it and I'm like, what happened? Be empty. Jim would have erased the entire thing. Because he wanted us to look at our work from a different perspective. So after several hours where I was not talking to him because I was so angry at him for doing that, I realized what was happening. By changing up your board, by getting rid of your backlog and starting fresh, maybe with a new tool, maybe with a new value stream, it forced me to really think about what was important. So often we keep things in our backlog that are expired. But because they're there, we feel like they're a commitment. So this causes us to always scrutinize what is on that ticket. Does this still bring us value? All right. So a lot of, because that's the other thing that Kanban allows us to do. It's, it's, um, it, um, you know, it makes us look at our work more intentionally. We're not just doing, now we're being intentional. You know, a lot of people feel that lean is about the elimination of waste. There's the definition of lean that Jim and I love. It's, and this is the definition we use at Modus, is doing more work with less effort and more intention. At the end of the day, we want to make sure what we were, are doing is bringing us value, is bringing our colleagues value, our organization value, as well as the end user value. But we have to start building systems where we get value from the work that we're doing as well. Beautiful. It's not just about being productive. I, I totally agree. I don't know. The, I'm, I'm looking for if there are some questions, but I don't see any. So if someone has some question, maybe can write it on the chat. And we can take questions after. I mean, you know, yeah. we're available on LinkedIn, email, people have questions. I do want to address one thing. And unfortunately, I think Matteo has left. Um, Matteo Angelotti wrote that he's going to start the Kanban this evening with his family to help the mental load of his wife. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what you, normally happens it, during lunch or in breaks when we're teaching is we're usually working on people's Kanbans for their homes. So try it out at home. Try it out with your kids. Try it out with your spouse. See how much work each of you are doing that each of you don't know, that aren't aware. I guarantee you'll appreciate each other more. So, Tonya and Jim, thank you so much for your time.
and uh, see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank this was you. lovely. I appreciate you all.